Boker Tov Havarim, and Shabbat Shalom. So uh, it's great. Uh, it's great to see such a good turnout uh, for today, um, particularly as we know it, it's tough times. It's heartbreaking times uh, in Israel today, as uh, we see that uh, Israel is on the verge of launching a ground offensive into Gaza. Uh, the fact that Israel's called up 360,000 reservists for the IDF as well, plus also the, the pain and the anguish um, that Israel is going through. And of course, we're going through as well as Christian supporters of Israel. Um, before I kind of talk, I'd like to say something of a uh, word of encouragement and support. Ever since David brought me on board with um, ICJ UK, can I say that this is, they are a group of people that are so committed to Israel, so committed to the Jewish people, and so committed to the God of Israel and the Messiah of Israel, Yeshua HaMashiach, that it's an absolute pleasure uh, to be part of this ministry that stands with Israel and the Jewish people in such a practical and amazing way. And uh, looking forward to our next recording of Jerusalem Dispatch with uh, Malcolm Heading on Wednesday. Uh, and it's vital in these times that we show that practical love and support to Israel and uh, and the Jewish community. I uh, recently had a, a diplomat on the Middle East report, interviewed him on Wednesday, and then went out on Friday night. Uh, at the Israeli embassy, I'm working very hard with the uh, with the press team, and they are just inundated. They are they are working their weekends, they're working through Shabbat to get information out to the journalists to put Israel's side of the story, to tell Israel's narrative. Uh, and that's what we, we can all do. Um, let, let's see where we are. So uh, two weeks ago, uh, Saturday the 7th of October, you know, it will go down in Israel's history as a day of infamy. It, is the, it was the worst mass terrorist attack that Israel has ever seen in a history. And according to the, uh, the president of Israel, um, um, sorry, my brain's gone a little bit at the moment. Uh, yeah, yeah. So it's been, a, it's been a very, very busy week, this one. Um, so anyway, essentially he said that more p Jewish people died on October the 7th, uh, 2023, um, in, died, in, well, sorry, my words are getting a bit... Uh, bit, bit uh, struggled with this one. So essentially what we're saying, we haven't seen anything like this since the Holocaust that was 80 years ago. I think that just brings the magnitude of what actually happened on, uh, on Saturday the 7th of October. The shock of this was the surprise of this. Israel didn't expect this. The Jewish communities didn't expect this. And just walking here today, when you just walk past Westminster and you see how many police vehicles there are, as uh, there will be in a couple of hours a huge march of solidarity uh, with, uh, with the Palestinians being organized by the Palestinian Solidarity Campaign uh, together with uh, an Islamist group that should actually be banned in this country called Hizbot Tahrir. How these people are allowed to walk on the streets, how they are able to incite hatred um, against Israel. And some of the slogans we've seen are horrific. I mean, uh, last week, um, we saw last week's uh, demo and rally. Um, some of those that attended actually had badges with the Hamas paragliders on their rucksacks and their T-shirts, glorifying in the terror that befell Israel last week. I don't know about you, but I, I think that's absolutely disgusting. And of course, we've also heard chants as well. Uh, many of you will be aware of that, uh, that Palestine will be free from the river to the sea. And what is between the River Jordan and the sea? It's uh, the state of Israel, the Jewish state. So effectively, we're seeing in our streets here chants of incitement to genocide, uh, which is absolutely horrific. Um, and that's why I think, you know, strategically, um, we are in this place today to give praise and thanks to the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and declare his name, and to declare that Yeshua HaMashiach is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. When we, when we just push aside um, the, uh, the, the, the actual, what actually lies behind this conflict, this is a conflict over who controls the land and which God is stronger. Is the God of Islam? or the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? And we know the answer to that. 
It's the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Um, and so we can rejoice in that. But let's uh, have a look at the number of Israelis that have been killed. So currently it's over 1,400, probably a lot more than that, have been murdered uh, two weeks ago by the hands of Hamas. Uh, we're seeing that now it's reaching about 4,000, those who are wounded and are critically injured. Uh, we've had anything between, I think it's now in the region of 300 uh, of Israelis have been kidnapped by Hamas. Thankfully, two um, Americans, a mother and a daughter, were released by Hamas, thanks to uh, the Qataris, were actually released, uh, which, is, which is great news. And, um, and also, we're, we're dealing with over 300 probably Israeli soldiers who have been killed so far in this conflict. You know, Israel is at war. This is the most dangerous period um, in Israel's history. Uh, ever since the rebirth of the modern state of Israel on the 14th of May, 1948, Israel's situation is grave. But she serves an incredible God. She serves the God of Israel. So we know and our prayers make a huge difference that we can pray and we can intercede in this situation. So we're not helpless because our weapons are not carnal. They're mighty and powerful. They're pulling down the strongholds because essentially this is, uh, this is a spiritual battle over the land, and the, the enemy is throwing his last dice, as it were. Um, Saturday, the 7th of October, will very much go down like the 7th of December, 1941, Pearl Harbor, or be remembered as November the 22nd, 1963, with the assassination of JFK, and also the 6th of October, 1973, which is the Yom Kippur War, but also 9-11. So it's imperative that at this time that we do all we can to show support and solidarity to Israel and the Jewish community. Um, I just want to, obviously we've seen the video footage uh, from our news reports. We've seen excellent videos produced by ICEJ looking what's going on. Um, I, ever since I learned about this horrendous terrorist attack against Israel on, on Saturday the 7th of October, I've been glued to watching I-24, which is Israel's uh, English news channel, uh, to get their analysis. I don't trust the BBC, I don't trust ITV, I don't trust Sky News uh, to tell Israel's narrative. So it's incredible um, when I've been working with, uh, with, the, uh, with the Israeli community and Israeli organizations back uh, over, over 20, around 20 years ago and saying that what Israel needs most is our own TV news channel that's in English, because you can't rely on the BBC, you can't rely on Sky News, you can't rely on CNN or even Fox News to tell Israel's narrative. And that's why it's so important that Israel has her own voice, that she has her own TV stations, that she can communicate her own narrative about what's happening. And of course, the uh, developments are very grave um, as Israel is preparing to launch a ground offensive against Hamas in Gaza. Um, also, can you, can you actually imagine the magnitude of what actually happened two weeks ago? Um, that 2,500 or more Hamas terrorists invaded southern Israel, which before would have been considered unbelievable. The Israeli military establishment, the Israeli government would not have thought that Hamas could literally um, blow up the, uh, the, the security fence by the, by the Gaza Strip and actually attack so many Israeli citizens uh, in the home, and which is only, can only be described as an actual a problem. Um, how did they do this? Well, firstly, Hamas uh, decided to fly in, uh, fire off over 5,000 rockets and missiles into Israel because they learned back in 2021 with Israel's last uh, military engagement with Hamas how to overwhelm Israel's Iron Dome missile defense system. So that was a test run uh, for what we've seen um, so far. Um, and then, of course, we see that air raids went off as far as Tel Aviv. That's 38 miles north of the Gaza Strip. Then we saw this uh, Hamas operation um, in, in its, its full horror. Um, and also, the, the fact is that uh, at 7.30 a.m., there were reports coming through that Hamas had breached the border in three places alongside the Gaza Strip, including its uh, border crossing. 
Um, and there's many reports coming out now that what actually happened was a very sophisticated cyber attack. So all of Israel's CCTV cameras went blank. Everything went black. Um, Israel was thinking that uh, Israel's uh, its border with Gaza is quite calm. So let's redeploy our forces into Judea and Samaria because we think within the kind of Palestinian Authority, this is where everything's going to flare up. So they, because it was also Shabbat and because it was, uh, um, it was also a Jewish holiday, uh, many actually thought that we don't need a large military presence in, uh, in southern Israel on Gaza's border. Um, but sadly, we see that uh, what happened was absolutely horrific. Hamas used IEDs, which are improvised explosive devices, to blow up and breach the wall and the security. They also used uh, paragliders to fly over the wall, used motorbikes and boats. And so this was a land, sea, and air offensive uh, against Israel on, on Yom Hat. Uh, Torah. Now, what's also interesting uh, is there's a couple of times that, that I've been to, to Israel, and I was in Israel during the last Intifada, and um, as part of a delegation, part of the Zionist Federation, when I was working there back in 2002. And um, if you remember the horrendous terrorist attack that, that occurred in, on Passover uh, 20, uh, 2002, and this was at the Hadira Hotel in Netanya. And uh, two Hamas suicide bombers walked into the hotel room whilst the Jewish people were sitting down for a seder meal and uh, blew up, uh, including Holocaust survivors, in that absolutely horrific terrorist attack. And um, so this was a few weeks after that. We uh, visited the hotel and literally, if you can see this building here, which is absolutely a uh, beautiful building that we're in here, um, there were two huge craters on the floor. And uh, the ceiling had been destroyed, and you still saw some of the pipes dripping with water. Um, and the carnage and the magnitude of that were, was absolutely horrific. And also, I remember a time when I was first in Israel back in 1996, and that was part of a, a program with the Hebrew University of, uh, of Jerusalem. And um, this was uh, an interesting evening because um, we'd be, I had. It's almost like two months up at a beautiful American kibbutz. Well, it's an Israeli kibbutz, but it was an American Jews that founded this kibbutz called Ein Shafet, which is very close to the Megiddo Junction uh, in northern Israel. Uh, and this place is like it's, it's like amazing. It's got Olympic-sized swimming pool. It's got football pitches. Um, and, and the community of those kibbutzes were, were incredible. Um, and I made some really amazing uh, Jewish-American friends as well, uh, as well as getting on very well with some of the local kibbutzes, kibbutz guys, or kibbutzniks as they call them. And um, this finished, and I uh, just went to with my friends down to Jerusalem because they were staying at the uh, Rosenberg's International School. Um, and while we were there, I stayed on, on campus, and it was Shabbat, and... Uh, uh, one of the girl, American girls there from, from uh, Washington, D.C. That's quite a funny story, actually. She, uh, I took her to go to the Western Wall, the Hogkato Haramavi, in Western Jerusalem, and uh, telling about the history, and then we walked up to the, uh, to the Mount of Olives. And while we were on the Mount of Olives, there was uh, some Israeli soldiers there with, uh, with their Israeli jeeps. And uh, one of the Israeli soldiers jumps onto the, his uh, bonnet of his jeep with his M16 assault rifle, playing it like it's an air guitar. Jumps down to me and says, excuse me, is this your girlfriend? I said, no, she's not my girlfriend. So uh, he then started chatting her up and said, don't mind if I ask her out on a date, do you? Um, if you know anything about Israelis, they're very confident. Uh, anyway, so this other Israeli guy got up to me and started speaking to me. And um, he literally had a, a picture on his key ring of uh, any of you into football would know the Israeli football player Al Berkovich. And uh, he was on the verge of signing for Southampton in the, in the Premier League back in 96. He says, this is Al Berkovich, and I love him. So after we had a, an interesting conversation about the security up on the Garland Heights, I said, um, do you want to lift back? So we got, jumped into an Israeli jeep full of M16 assault rifles together with bulletproof jackets. And they literally, we bombed it at speed through Arab East Jerusalem up to the Hebrew University of, of Jerusalem, which was quite a cool experience when, when you're 21. Um, so I've been in an Israeli jeep with the guns and, and, and what have you, and we're bombing through Arab East Jerusalem. 
Um, but the next day was a very somber day. It was uh, coming towards the end of Shabbat, and many of the Israelis and the Jewish people loved to go to uh, out on the streets to celebrate um, the end of Shabbat. And um, I was going down there. I was, I was with my friends. Uh, and then suddenly the Lord said to me, I want you to go to the Kotel. I went, you're kidding me, right? I, I'm, I'm with my friends. It's having a nice time. And then that voice from the Lord got stronger and stronger and stronger. So I said, okay, all right. I'll, I'll be obedient. I'll go down to the Kotel. It's nearly 12 o'clock at night, but, but I'll go. So I went down there. And this was the, um, just before the eve of, uh, of Yom Kippur. And if any of you have been in Israel, and particularly down by the Western Wall on the eve of Yom Kippur, it is swarming with the ultra-Orthodox, with the, um, uh, the, uh, with the horns ready to blow the horns to enter into uh, to Yom Kippur. And, and as I looked around, and I saw like there were eight Magin David Adom ambulances there, and I thought, that's a bit much uh, considering what's going on. So I, um, after then, I, uh, the Lord then pressed upon my heart to pray against a terrorist attack in Jerusalem. And I thought, well, okay, I will do. I'll, I'll be obedient to what you want me to do. Um, and I remember then trying to walk back through the Muslim quarter and thinking, this is eerie, silence, no one there. I'm not going to do that. So I then decided to walk back through the uh, Jaffa Gate, then walk all the way up to the Hebrew University of Jerusalem on Mount Scopus. And I remember meeting some Israeli soldiers there, and I said, is it safe to walk through here tonight? And they go, where are you from? I said, I'm um, Anglia. I'm from England. They go, no, oh, you'll be fine. And I said to me, I said, is it me, or is there a lot of tension in this city tonight? And they go, yes, we are preparing for a massive wave of suicide bombings to take place um, over Israel during the course of these holidays. We're on red alert. Um, and I remember walking from that news up to to go and stay with my friends on uh, Mount Scopus, crying my eyes out and said, these are the most beautiful people that I've ever met. The most hot, the, the people that show so much hos, hos, hospitality, so much love, so much warmth, and yet a terror organization like Hamas wants to, wants to destroy them for no other reason than the fact that they are Jewish. And I, that was my first encounter of really my heart breaking for Israel and really understanding really what this, this conflict was about. And um, it wasn't until I got back to my kibbutz a couple of days later that the front page of the Jerusalem Post said, Israel expects a wave of suicide bombings. Um, and that was a kind of reality check for me back then and um, still is today. And it just shows you the kind of importance to pray and intercede for Israel and the Jewish people. And when we uh, look at those southern communities, that, uh, that what we've seen um, is nothing less than absolutely barbaric. This is like something worse than the Holocaust of what we saw two weeks ago. Uh, I remember being part of the uh, Christian Media Summit. It's uh, organized by the Israeli government uh, last December. And uh, we went down to Kibbutz Nareem. We actually met um, the leaders of the uh, Eshkol Regional Council there. Um, and when you're, when you're there and you see these beautiful kibbutzes and you see these beautiful, pristine gardens and you, you get an atmosphere that this is a very close-knit community. And what was so extraordinary was the fact that they said that 90% of this time, this place is paradise. But the 10% of the time, when the rockets and missiles go over, it's hell. And uh, uh, I remember uh, speaking to them, and we were given an opportunity to ask questions. And I said, and they thanked us for being there to show solidarity with them. And I just said, can I have the mic, please? And I said, look, you're thanking us for being here. We need to thank you, because you are on the front line in defending Israel and the Jewish people. Uh, not only that, but you're also on the front line from defending the West against this evil ideology that is Islamic extremism that Hamas represents, that Hezbollah represents, that the Iranian regime represents, and you are defending the West. Um, sadly today that many of those leaders um, at, uh, who addressed us at Kibbutz Noreen are no longer here. 
Uh, many have been kidnapped and many have been killed. And, and the atrocities and the pictures that I've seen uh, from the, uh, the information given from the Israeli embassy uh, is absolutely horrific uh, and shocking. Uh, and what went on, uh, particularly in uh, kibbutz, um, uh, some of the kibbutzes has been absolutely horrific. Uh, and especially kibbutz uh, Berry uh, has been one, uh, which is absolutely being absolutely destroyed, um, as well as other, uh, other uh, kibbutzes as well. And what, what we've seen now and the brutality of it, the Israelis aren't releasing most of the information out there because it's too gruesome um, for people to experience. The, you know, the killing of babies, the beheading of babies, burning people uh, in their homes, and particularly in the bomb shelters that they've been in, um, the, the torture. They even found a torture manual of how to torture uh, these Israeli people. So not only did they find their communities to attack, but they were also tortured as well. Uh, their body parts mutilated as well. I mean, what those Israelis went through in southern Israel has been absolutely beyond, beyond horrific. Um, so we know that uh, also that uh, 260 young Israeli people were murdered at the all-night uh, nature party. It was called the uh, Suprema Nova Sukkot Music Festival. Uh, this occurred outside Kibbutz Nareem. Uh, that attracted some 3,000 young people. So we saw that 260 people were murdered and shot in cold blood. I'm sure many of you have seen the footage of all the cars trying to leave the entrances, and they were shot uh, with machine gun fire as well as rocket-propelled grenades. We see um, horrific stories of Hamas's mass raping of young women next to uh, dead bodies of their friends. Uh, many of the survivors were taken back to Gaza, and uh, we heard urgent cries of why did it take the IDF six hours to get onto the scene and actually rescue them. Um, right, so the danger now that Israel faces is we see that IDF troops are poised to go into Gaza, which will be a very, very difficult military operation. As we know that, uh, that Hamas uh, would have booby-trapped uh, a lot of those underground tunnels. Um, they use asymmetrical warfare, meaning they use men and women as, uh, as human shields. And no doubt they will also use some of the hostages as human shields as well. So the situation that Israel is facing in terms of its military operation to uh, destroy Hamas is fraught with danger. It is fraught with difficulty, um, but we know, as in cases when Israel has gone to before, that we see miracles happen. And uh, I just reminded a couple of times, that as we've just remembered, the 50th anniversary of the Yom Kippur War of, of 1973, when Israel was uh, faced a surprise attack by both Egypt and also from Syria up in the Golan Heights, uh, we saw a number of miracles taking place. Um, there was a case, for example, where um, Israel only had a few tanks and had to face 150 uh, Sy uh, uh, Russian, Syri uh, Russian tanks that were supplied to the Syrians, and it was only a few tanks to defend Israel from actually the, uh, the, the River Jordan and crossing into the Galilee. And yet what we see there is a supernatural occurrence is when they captured um, the uh, Syrian tank commander um, a few weeks after the war was going on. They asked him, you had Israel in your sights. You could have overrun the Galilee with your tanks and your weapons and caused absolute carnage. Why did you stop? And he said, the reason we stopped is because we saw a white man and a whole army of white men on horses that put the fear of God into them. Um, so we know that God is a miracle-making God, and that's why it's...